And good morning, church. It's good to see you here this morning. I hope you've had a wonderful week, wonderful weekend, uh, and I hope you look forward to a wonderful worship service as well. Did you catch that, uh, the scripture reading? The enthusiasm that David had as he was, this was David singing a song in uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 16, the enthusiasm he had for the idea of the worship of God. And more than just the idea of the worship of God, for God himself. Because of the things that God had done. Even that very last verse, and we'll come back to it once again. He says, give to the Lord the glory do his name. Bring an offering. Come before him. Oh, worship the Lord. How? In the beauty of his holiness. The beauty of his holiness. We've been talking about the fact that God is. New series we're doing. And it is sort of a, an understanding of the nature and the character of God. And just making sure that we have the fullest picture of who it is that we worship. Who, we, who it is that we give our life to. Who it is that we serve and submit to. Who it is that we put our faith in, our trust in. And, and the more that we understand about God, the stronger our faith can be. And certainly the more blessed our life would be. It gives more definition to who we can be in life. And I love that side of it, an aspirational aspect of it, built on the entity, the being of God itself, and how that emanates out towards us and how we choose to follow him. It has an impact on it. It's a deep, deep impact. Last week we talked about the fact that God is self-existent. God is self-existent. He needs no other source, no other power. God is self-existent. That's a truth about God. We move in this week to the holiness of God. The holiness of God. What do we mean by holy? Well, the purity. Morally and ethically, God is pure without sin. John, 1 John chapter 1, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. It's only 10 verses. But it says that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. And meaning that there is no evil in God. Not even a smidgen of it. Not even a little bit of it. He is pure. Absolutely pure and holy. John likes to write sometimes and he does the duality of things. It's either it is or it isn't. And then with God, there's no sense of degrees with his holiness. He is holy, purely right and righteous. That's a big thing to say. It, because when you think about humans, man, that's who you're going to pick for that. Who are you going to pick and say, and that person is not even a smidgen of evil. There's people you probably like and love that you're like uncomfortable saying that they may have some tendency towards it. I get that. I do. But at some point, at some time, there's been some sin, some evil, some thought, some attitude, some intent, and they can't be purely holy in the same way that God is. Let me give you an illustration for that. I just got back from a trip last night, which I went to a Bible lectureship in Denver. And it was fantastic, except for the airline stuff. What a nightmare. But I didn't even care, because so many other things in the trip was fantastic. It was at the Bear Valley uh, Bible Institute. Speakers, amazing. The way they organized that, always fantastic. Really look forward to that aspect of it. It was the principal reason of going. Number two, get to meet up with some people I haven't seen in a long time. Thrilled to see them. Uh, and also got to see, uh, you remember Tim and Denise Weimer's daughter, Maddie, got married, Sean. Sean went there, so I got to see uh, them and the new baby, which was fantastic. Uh, it's in Denver, which is beautiful. Um, it was great. A lot of things went well with it, but one of my favorites was renting a car. The car rental aspect, and no, this isn't me driving, but it's my attitude when I think about renting a car. Especially when you get the insurance, when they say, bring it back however, you've got the insurance. Okay, that seems like an invitation for adventure. But this particular car was interesting to me because it's a polarizing car. When we got on there and rented the car, we found out that for the same price that we could get like a normal car that you would rent, we could get a Tesla. And even when I would mention that to people, there would be a polarizing aspect to that. People were like, oh, you did what? You got a Tesla? Like, why are you so angry about that, man? But they would be, and I don't fault them for that because you've got opinions. And that brings us to the idea of purity. In some people's minds, that car, that beautiful, beautiful Tesla, you know where I am on it, they, it's not a car. In fact, it violates the purity and the idea of a car. 
I get it. Some people think back to a time when you cruised in a car, and there's a nostalgic reason for that, and they're appealed to a certain beauty and aesthetic of a car. Some, it's the classic muscle cars, and they would have a sound to them, and the way it reverberates is powerful, and there's something that stirs you in that as a car. I get that. I respect that. I really do. Some, it's the refinement and the comfort, almost like you are floating in a car, the idea of what a car could be. Some, it's just be as fast as you can, but technologically innovative as possible, sure. But what is the essence of car? What does it mean to be purely car? You may not care, but I promise you there's some people that do. And I know this by the way they would look at me as I sat in the Tesla. And I know this by the way that people would react when I would say, man, I got to drive a Tesla. And I loved it because self-driving, man, it works. Did I try that in traffic? Yes, I did. Did I try it in the windy, winding roads going up the mountains? Yes, I did. Was I screaming? Ah, yes, I was. It doesn't feel right, but it worked. And I love that, man. I love technology evolving and, and progressing and stuff. It's exciting. Is it fast? Yes. Yes, it is. It's super fun. Did I maintain the speed limit? Yes, because you can punch it in and control that it will not let you go above a certain thing. That's amazing. You can customize this car to your driving experience. Car. But you may think, that is a failure and repulsive. I get it. The essence of car. But when it comes to good, what is good? What is right? What is morally and ethically correct? There is a definition. Cars are subjective. Whatever makes you happy, that's fine. That's fine. But with what's morally and ethically correct, what is right and what is true, what is pure, there is a standard, and it is God. God is perfectly holy. You can argue about any other thing in the world that exists, but with God, he is pure, and he is holy, and he is just. And this matters. It really, really matters. It matters for your salvation, yes. It matters for your uh, thinking and what kind of person you're going to be, yes. It matters for your worldview and your outlook and your perspective and how you can get up every day and go, yes, there is good. There is definitely good. And there's more than good. There is God. And he is perfect and holy and just and cannot be corrupted. Can you think about anything else in the world that's like that? And to know that that's true, how could that not impact us? How could that not motivate us? How could that not draw us closer to him to be near a being that is so pure? It's magnificent. It's magnificent that that exists in truth. In the Bible, it gives us many ways that we can try to understand that, and that's really where we want to go in our understanding of it. You ever think about the Ark of the Covenant? And what that meant to the people, we'll go back to the Old Testament. And there was a command that was given in Exodus chapter 25 to Moses and the people that they were going to build this one particular thing called the Ark of the Covenant. Now, you may be familiar with it if you come to church on a regular basis because you've heard it in classes and such. But even in popular culture, the Ark of the Covenant is an iconic, historical, physical thing that existed. You've seen it in a multitude of movies and such. God gave very specific instructions for the Ark of the Covenant, but that's not what made it perfect. It had to be a certain size, two and a half cubits, by one and a half cubits, by one and a half cubits, so about 45 inches by 27 by 27. It wasn't huge, not even four feet long, not huge. And it had to be made out of acacia wood, and it had to be covered with gold inside and out, and it had four rings on it, and those were gold, and it had long poles that were covered in gold. And there had to be a thing called the mercy seat that sat on top of it, a lid, and it was, you know, two and a half cubits by one and a half cubits, and it would sit there. But on top of the mercy seat were two cherubim, and I'm not showing that because most of the time when they show the cherubim, it looks like just two regular people with wings uh, in long gowns. Cherubim in Ezekiel is described far, far more fearsome than that, so maybe we're uncomfortable with that description. But regardless, there was two cherubim, and their wings, they would face the mercy seat, and their wings would cover it. But the critical aspect is what God said that in that middle part, between the cherubim, that's where he would be when he would give commands to his people. So when we think about this object and its place in history, is it just a gold box? Is it just a gold box? 
It's impressive, but it's not the fanciest gold box that's ever existed, for sure. It, it's not the most complicated in its design. The dimensions don't really sync up with uh, too many things. I mean, it's, it's impressive, but why? Well, one, it's because God gave a command for it to exist, and so it did. And when they did construct it, because it did come as a commandment from the holy God, they built it exactly as God said. That is right, and that is correct, and that's what you should do. But the most critical thing about it is God's presence. When you look historically through the Bible at these moments in which the ark was present, it is not just a gold box. When Joshua was first going into the promised land, leading the people, the priests were to carry the Ark of the Covenant, and as soon as they carried that into the water of the Jordan River, because of the presence of God, and because God wanted people to know that He was with His people, the water spread apart. This is a signifier that God's fulfilling His promises, but also, most importantly, God was there. In His holiness, God was there, evident by this gold box that was constructed powerful. And even when they went in and the walls of Jericho were to fall, it was the Ark of the Covenant that would walk before them and in their obedience to God in which they would walk around the correct number of times and they would shout. It was God's presence there and God's promise that the walls would come down. And so they did. But there's even these lesser known stories that perhaps we should talk about a bit more. When the Ark of the Covenant was stolen from uh, Israel. And there was a time in which it was. They weren't winning a battle the way they should, so they thought, we'll take the ark as an object before us, and that's how we'll defeat the Philistines. Well, wrong process. In and of itself, it's just a gold box, but with the presence of God changes everything. And because they didn't consult with God, and they didn't follow the way God said to do it, they just took the box into battle. And they lost. And worse, the Philistines captured the Ark of the Covenant. And so in 1 Samuel chapter 5 and 6, you'll get this amazing story. When they took it into their temple, which they worshipped this pagan god named Dagon, there was an effect because God was not going to allow this victory of, of evil. Even in his presence would it come there. And so the statue of Dagon fell. And the head broke off and the hands broke off, which is... This is a mosaic of that uh, from this ancient site called Dura Europus. It's from the synagogue there. There's two interesting things about that place as an aside. It's an ancient synagogue where they have all these murals of Bible stories, which is fascinating. But also in that same location, there's also a house church. It's one of the earliest archaeological sites we have is a house church. When we get into the apologetic stuff, when we deal with archaeology on Sunday nights, we'll come back to that, but there's a little freebie for it. Another depiction shows them going into the Temple of Dagon, and the statue has fallen. And then they would move it. And every time they moved it, there would be some sort of plague or some sort of negative effect on the people, the Philistines who um, had took it. And then they tried to give it back to Israel. And eventually it ended up in this place, uh, Kirjath, uh, Jerome, which we'll get to in a moment. But it was more than just a box. And certainly in Leviticus 16, it's more than just a gold box. It describes the Day of Atonement. This is really where it's drawn the connection between God and His holiness and the people and the relationship there. The essence of God. The holiness of it. The Day of Atonement was to deal with people's sins. Well, you're not holy if you're involved in sins. And the people were involved in sins. There were a multitude of reasons and, and whys of it. And when their actions led to this, every year they had to the, the Day of Atonement. And the high priest would go in after offering sacrifices bull for himself and he would then kill there would be two goats they would cast lots one would be for uh, the Lord the other would be the scapegoat he would kill the goat that was for the Lord and he would go through various things and smoke would come up with the incense so that he could not see the presence of God lest he die but there he was the holiness of God in his presence in the holy of holies above the mercy seat of the ark of the covenant oh, can you imagine what that must have been like but only the high priest could be in there in fact, nobody else could even be in the tabernacle, as it were. And he would then sprinkle the blood of the goat, and this was for the atonement of the people, to purify them from their sins. Because if they were going to be God's people, they too needed to be holy. He wanted to regard them as holy. They would be his holy people. So sin needed to be dealt with. 
And the holy God would be the one who would present the method by which they could deal with those sins. But it had to start with the holy God. Who was there in the midst of that? More than just a gold box in that situation because God, God, holy God was present. And this was the connection between God and mankind and faith and obedience and most importantly, the relationship between God and man in his holiness, purity, righteousness, the most beautiful thing ever. It's more than just facts. It's not just a fact of God and his holiness. And it's not just fact, the dimensions and the size of the, the, the ark. There's a real relationship that's unfolding here. A relationship. It's personal. We see this when we, God keeps going through the laws in Leviticus and he keeps reminding them of his holiness and their need for holiness. And it's personal what he's saying to them. Leviticus chapter 11, verse 45. For I am the Lord. I am the Lord who brought you. That's personal. I'm doing a thing for you. I brought you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. That's personal. Meaning I'm going to watch over you and I'm going to provide for you and I'm going to care for you and I'm going to direct you and I'm going to lift you up and I'm going to bless you. I am doing this for you. It's personal. You shall therefore be holy. Why? Because I am holy. There was an expectation for the people to carry on that same characteristic that God had. Pure, holy. Let that be your identity. That's personal. Let that be what drives you. That's personal. It's not just a fact of the nature of God. We say, yeah, we agree with that. That's very, very nice. It's personal in the way that that corresponds from God to man and man responds to God out of faith. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 2. Still in the law, but he says, speak to all the congregation of the children of Israel and say to them, you shall be holy for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 26. And you shall be holy to me, God says. For I, the Lord, am holy and have separated you from the people that you should be mine. The word holy means separate, set apart. And God wants them to be unlike other people that are caught up in sin, that are caught up in unrighteousness, that deny him, that are opposed to them. Be set apart. Amazing. You may say, why did you give me three verses? I'll tell you why. One, there's a lot more, and we'll just stick to three. Number two, could we just got it with one verse? Kind of, probably. The subtle differences in the meaning of this, but if the fact that God repeated this over and over and over and had to, because sometimes it didn't stick in their mind, maybe we need to give it that much more attention and respect as well. Maybe we should think on this a little bit more. There they were hearing his voice and seeing the clouds and they saw the Ark of the Covenant and they had all those things, but there's so many times they would forget the holiness of God or they would turn from the holiness of God or they would not let that be their connection to him, their character, or the way they lived or their identity. It was just some fact that they acknowledged. Yeah, he repeated it a lot. King David repeated it a lot as well. There's a situation with the Ark in 1 Chronicles 13, through 16, where it shows just how personal it is. He's bringing it from kirjath Jerem. That's where the ark had remained through most of the reign of King Saul. And it would believe it was in the house of Abinadab, and they were going to move it. In chapter 13, they get this first attempt at it, and he's determined, hey, we're going to move it. And this is the most common telling of the, the part of the story, because in that moving, they get all these people together, and it's good for the people, it's good for him, they're going to move it. But they take this box, the gold box where the presence of God had been, which changes everything. And even though God had given very specific instructions on how to move it, they decided to do something different with it. Numbers chapter 4, if you want to look at even the intensity by which God gave rules uh, to move the Ark of the Covenant, there had to be Aaron and his sons were the people that when they took down the tabernacle and moved it, they were the ones that were to cover it. They were to take down the veil and they cover it. And then there would be uh, badger skins placed on top of it. And then there was a cloth of blue. It had to be blue on top of it. And then there was another set of the Levites that would be the ones that would carry it. That was their job, to be the ones to transport it. But they could not even watch it be covered by Aaron and his sons. God was very specific in what was happening. And the obedience to that would be part of being holy the, and, and respecting what was holy and what was respecting what was God's presence. So God gave very very intense directions for that. 
And part of the reason was to help people see and understand what it meant to respect the holiness of God, the majesty of God in that. Well, in this situation, 1 Chronicles chapter 13, that gets lost somewhere. That Ark of the Covenant had been sitting in this place and been protected for some time, but it, we wonder how often they had gone to it. Un unclear. There's some scriptures that suggest maybe they even had to look for it at this particular point. But David wanted to move the ark, and so he gathered them together, and they put it on an ox cart. Verse 7 of chapter 13, So they carried the ark of God on a new cart from the house of Abinadab, and Uzzah and Ahio drove the cart. David and all Israel played music before God with all their might, with singing and harps on stringed instruments, on tambourine, on cymbals and trumpets. And when they came to Chidon's threshold, Uzzah put out his hand to hold the ark, for the ox stumbled, and he died. Didn't respect the holiness of God. And God had told them, don't, don't touch it. There's very clear provisions here, don't. And he died. They were doing everything completely wrong in the midst of this. Right intent, I guess, to move it to a city, to put it into use, yes, but you've got to do it in a way that respects the holiness of God. You can't compromise on that. And there might be a temptation to say, well, but does it matter? <sighs> Maintaining the purity of the holiness of God, yes, it matters. Don't shortchange it, do it right. So then they kind of have to square that away and it sits in another man's house for about three months, Obed, Edom. And they come back to this in chapter 15 and they're like, we've got to get it here. But then they go back and David says this really important thing at the beginning. He's kind of been thinking about this. He's had three months and the approach is going to take a different turn. And in this, you can see a great respect for the holiness of God. He says in verse 2 of chapter 15, David said, no one may carry the ark of God but the Levites. Why? For the Lord has chosen them to carry the ark of God and to minister before him forever different mindset this mindset is recognizing God has said a thing holy God Lord God Almighty has set a commandment and if I respect and uphold the holiness of God I will maintain that purity I will respect the purity of God the rightness of what God has given in his command and I will reflect that in the way that I respond in truth in rightness God said this is who should move it, therefore that's how we'll do it. Different approach entirely. Right intent, right action, correlating together, respecting the holiness of God. And so he gathered all Israel together at Jerusalem to bring up the ark of the Lord to its place, which he had prepared. And then David assembled the children of Aaron and the Levites, of the sons of Kohath, Uriel the chief, and 120 of his brethren. And he's getting the right people in place. They're going to make this happen, and the point was to do it right. Verse 13 is an interesting one as well. He says, because you did not do it the first time, he's telling them to do it right the first time. He says, because you didn't do it right the first time, the Lord our God broke out against us because we did not consult him about the proper order. You didn't go to God in it. You disrespected him. You dishonored him. You weren't maintaining what is right and what is true and what is holy about God. Give it the due reverence, even in your obedience. Well, they do this time. And you get the sense of the personal nature of this in, in the way that they're carrying it off. They've gone back and reconsidered, how do we do it right? How do we move this box? It's more than just a box because the presence of God is going to be there. And we need God in our lives. We need God in our lives for worship, for direction, for commandment. We need his purity in our lives. How do we get it to Jerusalem where it's got to be prepared so that we can do all these things? Well, we got to do it right, which is respecting the way God said to do things. So they'll go back and they reevaluate it. But on top of that, this isn't just fulfilling a series of facts. I've checked that one off and that law and that rule. The celebration they have in the midst of this is incredible. He's got all these people gathered around, and they're making sure they're moving it in the correct way. And it's not easy to do so. But if you read in the passage, God is going to bless them. Go to verse 25. So David, the elders of Israel, the captains over thousands, went up to bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord from the house of Obed-Edom with joy. That's the leadership of the people doing this with joy. No excuses. We're going to make it happen. It's that important. that The holiness of God is with us. 
And so it was, when God helped the Levites, God helped them, he's involved at this point, who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, they offered seven bulls and seven rams. Verse 27, David was clothed with a robe of fine linen, as were all the Levites who bore the Ark, the singers, and the Chenaniah, the music master with the singers. David also wore a linen ephod. Thus, all Israel brought up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the horn, with trumpets and with cymbals, making music with stringed instruments and harps. Man, this is a celebration. This isn't just a halfway thing we're doing to fulfill an obligation. This is a direct connection between man and God and a response to it with a deep appreciation for the essence of God's holiness. People were moved. It was magnificent. Magnificent. I think about that sort of excitement about the character and nature of God when we come together for worship. How excited are we about the holiness of God? Are we intimidated by it? Are we grateful for it? It's personal. It's very personal. But even the way he came to this, after they got it there, he went on and he sang this song, which was their scripture reading. He wasn't done with just the the celebration and getting it there, and he was dancing and moving and celebrating, but he also wrote this song, and he sang about God in the midst of it. He was so overwhelmed and consumed by the presence of God, even that holiness that God was given to them. He sang this song, and this is only a part of it. You should read it in 1 Chronicles chapter 16. But he said, sing to the Lord all the earth. No one hold back. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his wonder among all the peoples. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is also to be feared above all gods. For all the gods and the peoples are idols. But the Lord, the Lord made the heavens. Honesty, uh, yeah, honor and majesty are before him. Strength and gladness are in his place. Give to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Give to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory. Do His name. It's do His name. Bring an offering and come before Him. O worship the Lord in the beauty of His holiness. Magnificent. Challenges us, doesn't it? Do I revere God in that way because of His holiness? And how do I think of God's holiness and what does it mean for my worship and my daily life and what does it mean for my direction and my comfort and what does it mean for what I'm going to do today or tomorrow God is light and in him is no darkness at all John goes on in 1 John chapter 1 not just to give that description of God but to then tell us to be light as well that's an interesting challenge 1 Peter Peter writes in uh, chapter 1, verse 15 and 16, I believe it is, God is holy, so we ought to be holy as well. Those same correlations exist, even for them in the New Testament, and certainly for us today, just as it did in the Old Testament as well. This has an impact for us. These aren't just facts. This is deeply personal. God gave us certain commandments and and things that defines what is morally right, morally wrong, ethically right, and ethically wrong, and there's a challenge to face those. God's holiness has to be upheld in that regard for us. It's a challenge today, isn't it? Because it seems that so much of the world isn't interested in what God says is right or wrong or true. Many things that we see in the Bible that God has said, there's people in the world that would cast them aside, and there's a temptation that might creep into us from time to time and say, well... Well, if, if God said this, but so much of the world says something quite different, wouldn't it be easier just to kind of go along with what the world is saying? There's a temptation from that from time to time. Sometimes you're conscious of it, and sometimes you're not as conscious of it, which is a good reminder that we should constantly check ourselves, talk to God in those regards. But think about what the world says about sexual immorality, and think about what the world says about marriage, and Think about what the world says about how we treat other people. Even treating other people. On that flight to Denver, worst flight I've been on ever. Uh, Left here about noon, got there after midnight. That's crazy. I don't know why I didn't get angry. I would like to tell you it's because I have perfect control, but no. But I just sat there going, shouldn't I be angry? I'm not. Lady behind me, 
furious, about to lose her mind. I am starving. I am thirsty. Rah! I was like, okay, I'm going to watch a comedy special, <laughs> whatever. So I sat there, and hours and hours and hours of this, and she kept losing her mind. And then this guy behind me, he was losing his mind, which was great to listen to as well. I wish he wouldn't. Don't get me wrong. Please don't lose your mind. But he was a coach for something. I think it was a hockey tournament. And he was just telling his players, you listen here. When we get there, I want you to go to bed. You eat a good meal, then you go to bed. And you keep them phones off. I was like, what is life happening? And I was texting uh, someone here, and I was like, man, I just hope they don't lose their minds. But I, I wasn't angry. And I was just like, I guess it's the power of comedy, I guess, in the midst of that. But it was these people that were probably good and decent people and probably thought of themselves as good and decent people. But they were casting it all aside because a storm diverted us and we had to refuel. Ah, okay, whatever. Not a conscious choice, but holiness got kicked to the curb. The idea of being decent and grateful is kicked to the curb. And it's so easy when that happens. Even as I'm in self-driving mode in that Tesla, I could see people's faces. Maybe it's because my hands were off the steering wheel. I was like, look. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. But we kick that to the curb sometime and way too easy. And sometimes it's way too popular to kick it to the curb. And that's when we got to go back to these stories in the Bible and just remember what people went through. They went through the same things we did. You may say, well, I know God says a lot of things and sometimes it's very hard and it doesn't mesh with culture. That's true. But think about the stories in the Bible when it never did. I mean, like historically, it's never meshed perfectly. Not everybody has always loved God's commands. Even when there was only two people on the planet, they made a choice not to respect God's holiness. They made that choice. And even there was a time in which almost everybody on the planet, however many that was, whether it was, you know, thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions, I had at one point all the hearts of men, except one and his family, except one, disregarded the holiness of God and their hearts were turned to wickedness. So much so that it grieved God that he made them. Man, that's, that's stunning to think about. But one guy... He said, it doesn't matter what culture says or everybody else says. It matters what God says is right and is wrong. And that's what I'm going to follow. And even his own people, God's people who were to be holy, as we said here, there were so many times they would reject him and turn from him and go to the false gods and the idols and chase after what other nations were doing. They didn't regard him as holy. They didn't regard his majesty. They didn't regard his perfection. They looked to other things that were simpler and more self-satisfying in the moment. And it caused them to drift from God. It caused them to drift from God. But not everybody did that. In the midst of that, there were people like Jeremiah or Daniel. And they would hold faithfully to God, even when it was insanely unpopular to do so. They stuck faithfully to God. Those are reminders to us. That even in moments for us today, when you're at work or you're at school or wherever you may be, it may seem really, really unpopular to uphold the holiness of God, to even speak the holiness of God. But nonetheless, God is true and God is holy and God is right. And so are his commandments and his expectations. And truly, they are a blessing, not a burden. They are a blessing. And we can't shirk those or disregard those or disrespect those or turn away from them. In fact, the world needs to hear those and see them. They may not have agreed with what Noah was doing, but they needed to see it because it was right as he reflected God into the world. And they needed to listen to Jeremiah, even though they ignored him and frankly tormented the poor guy, the prophet of God. But he spoke truth and holiness, and it was there. It was there for them to grasp if they would choose it. And some did, and some would. But even in that great moment when the holiness of God was on full display for everyone to see, so much so that we even talk about it, now, how can you ignore it? Jesus himself, God, the Son of God, came to earth, personal. God came to us and walked among us and spoke to us truth. Even then, people wanted to kill him, and even then, people wanted to reject him because they would look to something that was unholy, their traditions, their pride, their own self. And even when it went to that point where the Holy Son of God was hanging on the cross, this incredible moment on display of perfection, 
righteousness and holiness. Only a holy God could hang on that cross and pay for our sins. Only a holy God. And even then, people rejected him and mocked him and and spit and cursed. And even some of his own people who knew who he was turned away. Turned away because they were more fearful and showed greater respect, in a sense, towards the unholy and the injustice that was going on instead of the one true God. But even in that moment, he displayed incredible holiness because he cared about purifying us from our sins, our decisions that made us unholy and separate us from God. Even in that moment, he's thinking of us and loved us. My goodness. Holiness emanating out into the world, and we are the benefactors of that. If anything, we must be deeply, deeply grateful. At the very least, deeply grateful. And then we build on that and say, please tell me how I can be more holy like God. Be ye holy, for I am holy. Tell me how. Well, any of the people that did, the first thing they always did was include God in their lives, in every aspect of their lives. David got that right when he went back and corrected his mistake with moving the Ark of the Covenant. How does God want this done? Speak to God. Pray about it. One of the, I remember when I was younger, there was a prayer I heard where someone gave in which they were they're praying, and it, it caught me off guard because they said, God, forgive me of the sins I don't know I'm doing. It's like, What? I was pretty young, and I wasn't even thinking in those terms, and I was grateful for that prayer. Help me to be aware of the sins I don't know I'm doing. It reminded me of Psalm 139 when David is asking God, knowing that he has searched him and knows him, but he's asking him and trying to include the holiness of God in his life. Search me and know me. The prayer of wisdom to anything that is keeping me from being your your person... God, let me know. Help me have the wisdom to address it. Help me have the wisdom, the courage to face it. But God, also, let me include you. Please help me in the midst of that. That's the best thing you can do is include God in the midst of anything that would lead you to be unholy. Especially when you think about the things you may not yet be conscious of. But that's part of growing. That's part of growing. Which is what we want to do as Christians. Grow in our faith and pursue God, and learn to be more holy to the best of my ability. And those things that we know that we've done that are unholy, face them. Face them. You come to church this morning, it may be that you just raged out. You may sit there and reflect and went, well, I came to worship God, but man, I sinned 25 times today. I know it. Next week, I bet I can get 26. That's a terrible attitude. How about you go from 25 to 10, to 5, to 0, and pray to God that you're forgiven and you come to church, you come to worship, you come with a mindset that I want to be as holy as possible, Lord help me. And all the people that you've affected in the midst of that, maybe you speak to them as well. Maybe you need to make some apologies and maybe you need to ask for forgiveness and maybe you need to ask their help to guide you as well. But it's addressing our holiness as well. I'm telling you, the holiness of God is not something we just take as simply as a a fact that we throw out there. It's deeply personal. I'm grateful to know, no matter how evil the world may look, no matter how evil it may look, God will not be moved. God cannot be moved in His holiness at all. He cannot be corrupted. He cannot be bribed. You are not going to trick Him. You're not going to falsify a thing and get by it. He is true. He is right, and He is the standard by which we can move around, and it's always there. It cannot be corrupted. I just want to respect it. I want to know it. I want to move in it, because we realize being personal, He's holy for us and towards us, and so giving in that regard. That's what we want to focus on. This week, I hope you focus on being as holy as possible. I hope when you think about uh, an instance, you're thinking, how can I bring holiness, God's holiness, to a situation? When you are tempted to do something wrong and to act in a way that you know is not godly, can you stop yourself and say, let me bring holiness to the situation. Take a deep breath. Pray about it. Adjust and add holiness. Be holy towards people. Give that to the world as well. I hope that's what you're able to do. 
If that's something you struggle with, we should talk about that. You should go to your elders. You should go to your ministers. You should go to one another and work on that. It matters deeply. You are the church. You are God's kingdom. He created you and desires for you to be holy. Let's be as holy as we possibly can be. And then next week, even more so, learning it and knowing and appreciating him. I'm grateful you're here today. Today, if you've been struggling with that, you've been wondering about how you can approach God, just know that every moment that you're alive, every breath that you take, you can go to him. And you can be mindful of your salvation and, and you can be mindful of your repentance and you can be mindful of the fact that he will forgive. First John chapter 1 tells us he is just to forgive if we have the heart that's approaching him. Today, you may be wondering if you can be a Christian. It may be the first time you've heard a lot of this. I don't know all of the people that are online. I know some of you. And I know that maybe there's people that are wondering how to become a Christian. Please ask. We can talk about what faith means. We can talk about what repentance means. We can talk about what a confession means and, and, and commitment means. We can talk about baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We can talk about immersion. We can talk about faithfulness. We can talk about what the Bible says on these things. So you have it in truth. Have it in truth. Today, if there's a way that we can serve you, whatever it may be, let us know as we stand and as we sing.